The following is presented by the Computer History Archives Project. In June 1970, IBM introduced the System 370 family of mainframe computers. The System 370 was the successor line to IBM's very successful System 360 line. These three vintage film clips show an introduction to the System 370, as well as the 3330 disk drive unit and 3211 high-speed printer. Good day. I'm Bob Penley, speaking to you from IBM's Field System Center in Poughkeepsie, where, beginning today, we'll be demonstrating this System 370 Model 155 to our customers. One way we can show them how well this machine performs, what kind of throughput they can expect, is to run some of their actual data processing job streams. Then, have them compare these timings against timings on their present system. And that's exactly what we plan to show you today. But first, let's take a look at this System 370. Considering its power, it's quite compact. This particular system has a million bytes, or characters, of main storage. This demonstration is aimed at showing what the central processor and memory hierarchy can do. We're using input and output devices from our System 360 line, since they are compatible with System 370. Let's go back to the console. This little light is called a wait light. When it comes on or starts to flicker, it is telling us that the central processing unit, the arithmetic and logic section of the computer, could be handling even more work than we're giving it. At the start of the demonstration run, however, the CPU is going to be pretty busy because we have loaded into the system a typical user job stream, a mix of 25 user jobs, programs, and data, consisting, for example, of Fortran, COBOL, and assembler jobs, along with a tape sort. The Model 155 can be working on as many as 15 different jobs simultaneously under its operating system multiprogramming. Some jobs will be processed in a few seconds, others a few minutes. As the CPU completes each job, it will log the time it started and finished on our console printer. At times in the job stream, that wait light will start to flicker, indicating that the CPU can handle more work. We could, if we wanted, start entering more jobs, but today we'll just let this job stream run all the way through. We have completion times for System 360 Model 50, which processed those same 25 jobs earlier. At the end of the run, we'll compare results. Okay, let's let the job stream run. Notice that the wait light is dark. The CPU is going full tilt, exercising hundreds of thousands of instructions a second as it begins working on the first few programs in the job stream. As I mentioned earlier, this particular Model 155 has a million bytes of processor storage. However, a user can have from 256,000 bytes to as much as 2 million bytes or characters of storage. We are running this job stream on the Model 155 under the most efficient operating system available, called OSMVT, which is being used now by many System 360 users. In other words, the Model 50 user can convert to the System 370 Model 155 with minimum effort. We'll talk about other key features of the Model 155 a little later, when we show you a part of our Model 155 production line at our Poughkeepsie plant, some seven miles from here. You should understand that to run the entire job stream will take longer than the very few minutes we have in this segment of the announcement program. So right now, we'll let the job stream run and return near the end. Now we are in the final minute of the Model 155's run of the job stream. I've already posted the results of the earlier run on the System 360 Model 50. There's the end of the run. Now, let's check the console printer for the timings on each job and for the entire 25 jobs. I'm going to post these results alongside the Model 50 timings. Let's see what we've got. Let's look at the 155 listing first, and we'll find a code name that'll be easy to identify. Here's one called COIL, a Fortran compile job. It had a start time at 11.09.08, and it ended at 11.09.51, giving us a total elapsed time of 43 seconds. Now let's find a job with a few more steps. Let's see. Here we 
have a perk job. We had a Fortran compile, a link edit, and a go step. It had a start time of 11.22.47 and an ended time of 11.23.29, which gives us a total elapsed time of 42 seconds. Now let's find these same jobs on the Model 50. Here's our coil. We had a start time of 20.22 and ended time 21.58, which gives us a total elapsed time of a minute and 36 seconds, or 96 seconds. Now let's find that PERT job. Here we go. We had a start time of 59.02 and an ended time of 1.00.53, which gives us a total time of 111 seconds. Now let's look at the total elapsed time. First on the 155, we had a start time of 11.08.06 and an ended time of 11.30.48, which gives us a total elapsed time of 22 minutes and 42 seconds. Now on the Model 50, we started at 17 minutes and 5 seconds after midnight. We have an ended time of 1.18.55, which gives us a total elapsed time of 61 minutes and 50 seconds. As you can see, it took about one third of the time to run the same job stream on this Model 155. Of course, these timings apply only to this particular mix of jobs. System and processor throughput will vary in any computer installation, depending on customer applications, his job mix, his input-output equipment, and many other factors. There will be many demonstrations over the next few weeks, and certainly members of the press are welcome to come to Poughkeepsie. We think the Model 155 is a truly fine performer. Thank you for letting me show it to you. Good morning. I'm Mel Crable, manager of one of the assembly and test departments here at IBM's San Jose, California plant. I'd like to show you some of the 3330 disk storages that we're building here. This is one of the rooms we use in the manufacturing process a dust-free assembly area. What you're seeing now is one of the modules that house two disk packs. A 3330 may have from one to four modules depending on how much online storage the user needs. In this room, as the new units are assembled, the module has its power turned on and the precision reading and recording heads are tested with the disk for the first time. Each module, like this one, has two drawers. Of course, when the unit's complete, the drawers will open automatically with the push of a button. But for now, I'll pull the drawer out manually. Back in 1956, when we pioneered disk storage with the RAM Act, we were very proud to have gotten 5 million characters stored on 50 disks. This single pack I'm holding with a dozen disks can store 100 million characters. To give you an idea of why we're concerned about cleanliness at this point in the process, these recording heads never touch the disk surface. Between the head and the surface of the disk is a thin layer of air measuring less than 50 millionths of an inch. Of course, once the 3330 is installed in a customer's computer site, there's no need for a dust-free room, since the machine is designed to purge itself of dust particles automatically. We are now in another testing area of the plant. What you're seeing is the 3330's control unit. This is the box that takes orders from the central processing unit, relays them to the reading and recording heads, and transfers data to the computer. Another thing this control unit can do is let the users link the database stored in the 3330 to two separate central processing units. Now I suppose you'd like to see what the 3330 looks like when all the modules are put together. So let's take a look at a demonstration of an industrial design model. 
We believe the 3330 sets a new standard for information storage and retrieval, and we think the user who is moving toward large database applications in the 70s is going to like what this machine can do. He will be able to tap into as many as 800 million characters. As a comparison, that RAM Act not so many years ago had a capacity of only 5 million. What's more, the System 370 will be able to find what it needs among those 800 million characters in an average time of only 30 thousandths of a second, 20 times faster than that RAM Act, and twice as fast as the currently available IBM 2314. The rate at which the new 3330 can stream data into the computer is over 800,000 characters a second. With this combination of capacity, access speed, and transfer rate, we think we've come a long way in disk storage. We appreciate this chance to talk with you and show you something of which we are very proud. I'm Jim Brownlow, and I'd like to show you the new IBM 3211 high-speed printer. That's an important part of today's announcement. The machine is undergoing final pre-production procedures at IBM's laboratory here in Endicott, New York. The 3211 operates at a speed of 2,000 lines a minute. That's almost twice as fast as IBM's fastest printers now available. This can be increased to 2,500 lines a minute by using sets of 36 characters rather than the standard 48. Let's see how it all happens. A continuous train right here helps make high performance printing possible. We have over here an extra train that we can use to show what's happening inside the printer. The train has nine complete sets of 48 characters. The print hammer is pushed against the desired character at a very high speed. The trick is to push the right character against the paper and then get the hammer out of the way fast. This is quite an engineering feat considering that the train is traveling over 200 inches per second and the paper is moving at speeds up to 90 inches a second. The 3211 is the fastest printer IBM has ever made. The lines come out even, and the printing is clear, even on multiple copies. We know the 3211 will be a valuable aid to the System 370 and System 360 data processing manager. The typical DP installation is faced with a growing list of reports and other printed material that must be delivered to many other departments. This new unit is a big step toward increasing an installation's throughput, and that's one of the key measures of a computer's effectiveness. Thank you for letting me show it to you.